Well, hello there. Thank you for inviting me to hang out in your eardrums. I endeavor to make it a pleasant experience. This is Sarah Wendell from Smart Bitches Trashy Books. This is Smart Podcast Trashy Books, episode number 409 with Nalini Singh. Yay! Keeping with recent tradition, this week we have a spoiler-free discussion of Alpha Night by Nalini Singh, which is out. We are going to talk all about the book, no spoilers, and we're also going to talk about quarantine baking, gluten-free baking tricks, mating at first sight, alpha females, consent, and writing series, plus what she's working on now. Yay! I will have links to all of the books that we mention, especially all the books that Nalini mentions, because she brought a list, because she knows what's up. I'll have links to all of that in the show notes, and you can find those at smartbitchestrashybooks.com slash podcast. Speaking of podcasts, uh, Pat, podcasts, uh, podcasts, yeah, I didn't need to make that complicated. If you are looking for a new show to enjoy, I have an idea for you. Hey, everybody, we are Learning the Tropes. I'm Aaron. I'm Clayton. And I'm the romance novel veteran. And I'm the virgin and every week we read a different romance novel and then we talk about what we loved about it we talk about all of our favorite tropes we talk about only one bed secret places secret places that's mine you stole it (laughs) every trope under the sun Mm -hmm. so to give you a little taste of our show we're gonna play a clip from the episode where we reviewed lisa claypass's dreaming of you so i started reading this book and i immediately loved it (gasps) <laughs> I love this book. Oh, I'm so happy. This is one of my absolute favorite books in the world. Yeah. I love Lisa Claypath so much. And if you were not into this book, I was like, I don't know what I'm going to do. This is going to be so upsetting to me. I am so happy that you loved it and that we could just fangirl out for the yes. next hour because that's all I want to do. <laughs> I didn't want to have to defend it. <laughs> Learning the Tropes comes out every Wednesday and you can listen to us anywhere you listen to podcasts. So come check us out. So if you are looking for a podcast to listen to while you quarren bake or quarren clean or quarren cross stitch like me, I hope you give them a try. I will have links in the show notes to where you can find Learning the Tropes or you can search for them in your favorite podcatcher. This episode is also brought to you by Ritual, which is a daily multivitamin that is obsessively researched for women. Ritual is vegan-friendly, sugar-free, non-GMO, gluten-free, and allergen-free, and all of the sources for the nine nutrients inside are provided for you to read and research on your own. Ritual is designed to be an easy way to build a daily vitamin ritual. The subscription box of vitamins will arrive on your doorstep just as you finish your last one, and it's only a dollar a day to have your multivitamin delivered. I really like the delivery, so I don't have to remember or mark my calendar or make a list and go to the store because we only go to the store once a week. And I also like knowing what's inside each capsule. That's very cool. Ritual is offering you 10% off your first three months. Fill in the gaps with Essential for Women by visiting ritual.com slash Sarah, S-A-R-A-H, to start your ritual today. That's 10% off your first three months at ritual.com slash Sarah. I have a compliment. I love doing this. It's one of my favorite things to do during the intro. So thank you to everyone who has pledged to the Patreon. And thank you to those who want me to do a compliment because it's so fun. Lisa M., this compliment is for you. Your loving personality and ability to make people laugh has inspired several people you know to name their pets and or children and or favorite things after you. If you would like a compliment of your very own handcrafted by me, yours truly, have a look at patreon.com slash smartbitches. Monthly pledges start at a dollar, and every pledge helps keep the show going and makes every episode accessible to everyone. Hello again to our Patreon community. Thank you for being so truly excellent. I will have links at the end of the episode, but let's do the start of the episode. On with my conversation with Nalini Singh. Hi, Nalini. Hi, Sarah. It has been so long since we've chatted. How are you? I am good. How are you? I'm okay. Um, how's it going in New Zealand? Uh, yeah, pretty good. We're um, we're just going into autumn, fall now. The weather is fantastic. It, in fact, it's so fantastic that we haven't had enough rainfall uh, this season. So uh, we might be going into water restrictions. <laughs> which oh, is that's great. just what you want. <laughs> yeah, that's I know. Just great. <laughs> but we're hoping since we're going into fall that, you know, it's going to start raining soon. So it should be fine. Doesn't it rain like once a day in New Zealand? Isn't that the rule? Unfortunately not. Unfortunately, the summer has just been, was just brilliant. 
so much sunshine and you know shorts and t-shirt weather uh, but yeah yeah we just didn't get um you know normally you would get a bit of rain in the summer as well but nothing so oh. are you all still quarantining or have you been let out of your houses uh we are now we're currently level three which means there's a little bit more movement um, and some people can go back to work. So if you work like outside or, you know, not in close proximity to people. But um, from Thursday, we're going into level two, which is much, you know, much more freedom. You can go and see people and just uh, gatherings aren't allowed, mass gatherings. Right. So, yeah, we're slowly sliding out of, you know, quarantine. But, uh, and fingers crossed. All right. So um, I follow you on Instagram and mm -hmm. I came very close to reporting you for pornography with some of the baking that you did. Holy quarantine baking. What did you make? Oh, uh, it's way too much stuff. Just like everybody else. <laughs> you know, just like everybody else. But um, there's this one recipe that I really recommend, which is uh, Sally's Baking Addiction has a recipe for uh, peanut butter chocolate cupcakes so they're like peanut butter cupcakes with chocolate fudge icing and oh my god just <laughs> astonishing and the other thing I baked a lot of was um cheese scones so scones I don't know it's not a big oh. thing in America I think um oh, so good they are so good and they're so easy to make and um so I'm celiac and I have to always do substitutions for gluten-free stuff. And uh, one of my top tips for anyone else who wants to do a substitution is um, for a scone, for a perfect scone, just replace a third of the whatever flour you're using with almond meal and just makes the perfect scone. You just Honestly, I took them out of the oven and I just ate like half the tray just standing there while it was still hot from the oven <laughs> with butter just delicious <laughs> so do you use like a gluten-free flour and then you substitute in a portion of almond meal and yeah. that's your hack that's my hack I, I I've tried I have I have taken you know taken the hit for you guys and tried it multiple times and it's been perfect every single time so they're just light and flaky and they come out beautiful oh that sounds yeah, that's, that's so you know fun. you have to do some more baking, like right, Sarah? You know what? It's fine. I'm okay with that. I think I need to make scones and I think I need to make some of these cupcakes. What did you do to substitute for the chocolate cupcakes? Are they flourless? No, no, they've got flour. I, that's like a normal person recipe. And then I just, um, <laughs> <laughs> for us special people, I, um, Oh, I have I have lots of different flowers at home, so sometimes I just do kind of a mad scientist mix and see what comes out. But uh, just a normal gluten free baking flour should do the trick. They're quite nice. soft and moist, so um, yeah, they don't need to rise a lot. They don't need a lot of structure. Yeah, yeah, no, they just they just work. I mean, peanut butter and chocolate. Where can you go right? wrong with it? Yeah. And honestly, the peanut butter is its own structure. You don't need gluten when you have peanut butter holding up your this baked goods, true. right? This is true. This is true. This is true. So I'm going to need to find links to these recipes because if I don't share them when this episode goes up, people are going to be so mad at me. <laughs> All right. So Alpha Night is almost here. Yay! Yay! Are you excited? I am. I am. It's it's always uh, so exciting when the book's about to come out because for me, you know, I s finished writing it quite a few months ago. So I've been waiting longer than anyone to have it out. <laughs> now, do you ever have a problem when you're promoting a book and you're writing a book at the same time and you have to think, wait, which one am I talking about? Yeah, sometimes I have to be like, um... Let me just take a second there to shift <laughs> gears backward. Yeah, you know, to that book I wrote 18 months ago. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so what can you tell readers about this book? Because there's some books where you're like, I can tell you the title <laughs> and that's about it. <laughs> No, I can tell you lots about this book. It's, all right, um, tell me all about it. Tell me. Okay, so it's part of the Sci-Changing Trinity series, but I think you can pick it up 
you know, if you feel like just diving into this book, I think you can because these are two characters where we haven't really been in that part of the world before. So we're in Moscow um, specifically with the wolf pack and Mm -hmm. and we haven't had a story set in the wolf pack in Moscow, the changelings there. So we've had a bear book but not a wolf one. So I think it is, you know, doable to walk into this book because you get introduced to the the wolves, the black edge wolves. And um, so it features their alpha. And the really fun thing about this book is that it's the first time I've written a female changeling alpha as the protagonist. And so that's, you know, really was really fascinating to write and really interesting. and. Each character is unique, um, but alphas have certain traits that go across um, different um, animal changelings and whether um, and gender and all of that. So that's one thing that was really interesting. And the other thing was that it features a mating at first sight uh, storyline, and that's you know I've never done that in the series before, and that was also you know super interesting to write. The, especially because the hero is an arrow and arrows are like basically like super soldiers, you know, and trained to be emotionalists. And Ethan has just a really interesting backstory, but that initial contact between the two of them, it's just explosive. And yeah, I just had so much fun writing these two. So what were some of the things about writing an alpha female that you liked? I love, love alpha female stories. Um, I've written quite a few very strong female characters in the series. I know, I love them. (laughs) (laughs) And what I like about writing the, well, particularly I'll I'll stick with Selinka. What I really liked writing about Selinka was that even though she's alpha, she is very much herself. She, So she's not trying to be an alpha the way a male um, in the world might try to be an alpha. But, you know, she's she lets the, the pups in the clan, you know, paint her nails if they want and put stickers on her. And she's she's got that, um, how do I put this? She She doesn't change herself in being alpha. She is alpha because of who she is. Mm-hmm. And so all the elements that make her Selinka also make a really good alpha. What are the things that you think make a good alpha? I think it's not about brawn. Like in the changeling world, um, physicality does matter because uh, they have, you know, they have challenges uh, against their rule, maybe from outsiders, and they Mm -hmm. have to be able to protect the pack. But that's not the heart of it. Um, A good alpha is very intelligent and one thing that comes up you know in a lot of the books that feature alphas is that they have to have this huge heart because that heart has the capacity to love every single person in their pack you know they are the shoulder to lean on for every single member of their pack and so Selinka you know she has that huge heart she has the capacity to love um you know, an enormous amount. And I think that is at the core of what makes the best alphas, that mix of intelligence and heart. Yes. And and that and that the intelligence in the heart also focuses on where the pack is now and what needs to happen to keep the pack whole and safe. So there's almost like an immediate and a forward thinking um, element to the way that they care for the group. Yes, absolutely. Uh, A good alpha is thinking, yeah, not just about the now, but also about the future Mm -hmm. and not just in terms of the the people in the pack. So they're thinking about the the young and where -hmm. where that will be in the future and how to help them become the best people they can be. But they're also thinking about, you know, the financial health of the pack and how to position it politically so that – it's all about protecting their people and right. making the situation the best possible situation for their people. So they're constantly juggling like multiple elements um, to 
make sure their pack goes from strength to strength. Yes, it's like a it's like a, a blend of of caretaking and strategy. Yes. They're like, you know, in a way they're CEOs of their pack. Yeah. You know, they, and um but in a much warmer sense. So they're not just looking at the finances or the business. Um at the core of it um is their people and making sure their people thrive. So the alpha of your pack, uh, Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern, Ardern um, <laughs> she would be a pretty good alpha. She, you know, I think she's proved herself. She would be a very good alpha. Over here, not so much. <laughs> I'm sorry to say. <laughs> but you have a person who is going to lead through caretaking and strategy at the same time. And that's that's really hard because there have to be there has to be um, an emotional connection to everyone. I mean, all of the changelings are so emotionally connected to each other on an entirely different level. But at the same time, there has to be a strategic uh, enforcement of boundaries and an understanding of, like you said, the young and the finances and the politics and where the pack is always with an eye of keeping the pack safe. That, yeah. um, that's a very resonant message, ma'am. Yeah, and I think... Um, <laughs> I, I won't spoil it, the book, but there is a point in the book what you say about boundaries as well. Um, and that does come up, you know, about uh, the emotional connection. But at the same time, they can't be driven only by emotion as well. Yes. There are boundaries that can't be permitted. Um, they can't, you know, Selenko can't permit certain boundaries to be crossed. Um, and again, it comes back to the health of the pack and their future, and, yeah, who they are going forward. Yeah, a few parallels to, to current situations, like a few, like maybe one or two. <laughs> Possibly, you know, maybe, I, maybe yeah. I told the future. So do you have lotto numbers? <laughs> <laughs> well, if I do, I'm not sharing them. See, this is why you're no fun. <laughs> <laughs> I'm keeping them, you know, to hoard flour and, you know, bake peanut butter cupcakes. You know, I suppose that's a really good use of your lotto winnings. I mean, <laughs> if you're going to make things, that, 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 seems to, that seems to be like a good usage of it. So one of the things that I love about your series is that there are different, there are definitely books where you can go in to the series at that book, but you will miss some things that have, that have like built to that moment. Like Heart of Obsidian is an example. If you haven't read prior books, you might miss some of the nuances, mm. but you can still go in and be like, yeah, okay, this guy crushes mountains. Got it. Not a problem. Um, with this book, there's the, this is still an entry point. People can come into the, to the Trinity series and walk into this part of the world and be like, okay, yeah, I got it. All right. Yeah. Is that a difficult thing to do? Cause you have one part of your brain that's thinking, actually it's the same. It's almost the same. You have one part of your brain that's thinking about the community of your readers and the, and the pack of people who have followed you so far. And then you have the part of your brain that's thinking strategically, like how do I in, in bring new people in so that they can also join the community? Yeah, it's, um, it's easier when I'm going into a new pack or a new, you know, segment of the society, because then I'm introducing them to everyone regardless, because nobody really has met, um, for example, you know, we've met Selenka, but we don't really know anything about her. So, mm -hmm. um, so books like this, it is easier, uh, just like it was with Silver Silence, where we went into the bear, you know, the bear clan, because again, we, we didn't know anything about them. But I try not to repeat things. I think I have faith that readers will pick up on where the storylines are continuing, especially like the mm -hmm. background plot. I think readers are very clever at picking up threads. And, um, you know, I did have people who jumped into Heart of Obsidian and absolutely loved it. So I think, yeah, it's... um. It is. It can be a hard balance sometimes, and every so often um, I have to rely on my editors to sort of say, hey, you need to put in a little more explanation here because it's just going to be incomprehensible to someone who picks up this book in between. But at the same time, there do need to be entry points into a series because I don't want the series to get so big that it's, it doesn't feel welcoming 
to new readers. Um, yeah, I, I'm a series reader myself, so I know how important it is to have be have that ability to sort of jump into a series because you're interested in it, and at some point you can pick it up without reading, you know, 15 other books. Yeah. I'm sure you, you've, you've gotten this question before, but it just occurred to me, is there a group that you like writing about most? Or is there a group that you're like, oh, I cannot wait to write this. I cannot wait to write this. Or do you like moving between the different packs and moving between the different side groups? Is it, is it fair to even ask if you have a favorite? Because I mean, it's your world. It's all your favorite. <laughs> yeah, they're all my favorite. The, actually, yeah. <laughs> the, my problem is that I want to write about everybody. So... <laughs> It's it's actually really difficult to keep myself really super focused and not bring in characters that really have nothing to do with the story and I just want to see them again so I just want to write about them which is why I do the short stories you know for my newsletter because it's it's a way to sort of itch um I was going to say scratch that itch you know or yeah way to fulfill myself in um, bringing in other characters but um, yeah I, I just love the world I just absolutely love the world and I love going into any of the groups of people that live in that world because even when it's say a new group that I'm writing about for example the wolves in this book they've been living in my head for a really long time so they're not <laughs> new <laughs> To me, they're like, oh, I finally get to pay it, you know, like really spend so much time with them. So, yeah, yeah. No favorite. I, I love everybody. that. <laughs> I love the idea of you just sort of sitting there going, yes, 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 yes. I'll, I'll write about you in a moment. Hang on. It's fine. <laughs> How big is your series Bible and your, and your world guide? Am I remembering right that your sister keeps that for you? Yes. So I used to keep it myself. And then it just became too ginormous. And so now she keeps it. And it's, I don't even know how big it is now. It's pretty big. But there's Have you ever certain... thought about publishing it? No, no. Because it's, it's like, it's the way my brain works in terms of how things are <laughs> referenced. So it'd be like, and here is the inside of Nalini's brain. And it would make no sense to anybody else. But um <laughs> One thing Ashwini does for me with every book, and it's particularly when, so I didn't need this for Alpha Knight, but I would need it for books where we've known characters for a long period. So, for example, when I wrote um, Shards of Hope, um, mm -hmm. she did what we call the manifestos. She did an Aiden manifesto, and it had like reference to every single time Aiden has appeared in the series because what I do for long-term characters like that is I go back and I read every single piece about them in previous books. I think I've uh, said this before when we've been talking, I have a tendency to delete material, you know, because of my process, the way I write, I write quite a lot and then I delete and, and tighten things up. But sometimes I have information in my head that isn't necessarily in the books. So I make sure I go through, you know, and an, a character's entire journey through the series to make sure that when I'm writing, I'm not assuming the reader has information. Mm -hmm. And I've also, I've also sort of uh, refreshed myself on their journey so that I'm, their character is really vivid in my mind. And mm -hmm. I've picked up all the little bits and pieces about the history. And, yeah, so um, we do that for the characters. And then there are some things that I still maintain myself, which is the most important of which is the overall series timeline, which I basically lives in my office all the time. And this just allows me to reference, you know, big world events. And um, keep track of things like the ages of children. Um, <laughs> I remember you telling me you had someone pregnant for like a year and a half. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was like, yeah, that was that was smart. But I picked it up <laughs> thanks to the timeline. So if you're a writer listening to this, make sure you keep a timeline. <laughs> Otherwise, you have elephant lying pre elephant that's right, pregnant. That's right. That's right. Then you have to explain to people, oh, yes, well, in this world... 
People are <laughs> pregnant for a really long time. <laughs> <laughs> So I know when we spoke about Heart of Obsidian, you had a little post-it note or a note on your computer that was sort of the overarching, like three, it was like, it was like three words, like mm. a three word theme to the book um, that was sort of guiding the story. Did you have a similar note for this book? It was, um, yeah, I did. It was more like, um, like a little phrase and um, it it was night, night to his to his queen and that's something that actually Ethan says in the book you know I am the knight to your queen and it's not necessarily I don't want to spoil it but like Selenka is kind of like no that's not how I think of the relationship but for him that's how he thinks of the relationship and that was really critical in terms of it just gave, put me into his head straight away and he was the character that was new in this book. And mm -hmm. so having that, that just that phrase, I always knew who Ethan was um, as I wrote the book. And, um, and I always knew what Selenka's response to that would be, which also gave me her character and her story. But um, I just think that phrase is so perfect for this book and how the characters interact and how their relationship grows. That's so cool. And I know exactly the minute you said it, I was like, oh, okay, yeah, I get it. Absolutely. Yeah. What are you the most excited about for this book when it reaches readers? The same as always. Honestly, I just hope people love it. I'm excited for them to meet these characters and just be part of their love story because it is, it's a beautiful love story. It's got so much heart and they're just such great characters and yeah, like I said, I just love this entire world and I can't wait for people to return to it. That's so great. It's, it is it is so lovely how much affection is in your voice when you talk about the world <laughs> you created. Like you're just so happy. I am. I am so happy to return to this world. And, you know, I still reread books in the series and they bring me so much joy. And so when readers write to me and say, oh, I'm rereading the series, that to me is such a compliment because I know I reread my favorites, um, you know, books by other authors, and I know how much joy they give me. So to know that readers find that in my books is just, it's just a gift. Oh, yes. And I actually wrote an article for the Washington Post newspaper about how rereading is something that people are doing a lot of just because you've already done the construction work in your mind of, of, of building the world. Rereading allows you to just visit. Yeah. I read that article. It was fantastic. And I agree oh, with thank what, you. what you said. Yeah, no, it was really, really good. And I absolutely um, understand. I know that when I'm really stressed and I just want to, I need time out, I'm more likely to reread because yeah. there's comfort in that and knowing in, and you know these people already, so it's like hanging out with friends. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So do you reread your own books sometimes? Does your writing work on you? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Like I was saying, you That's know. That's so cool. Yeah, I just, I love it. I I write what I want to read. And so sometimes I'm like, what should I read? And I read something I've written. And um I might not read it all the way through because obviously I know like my brain's filling in what's coming because by the time I write a book, I've read it probably 20, 30 times. So it's all there in the memory banks, but I read my favorite bits. And sometimes I read the bits that just make me cry like a faucet. Um, <laughs> you know, blaze of memory is really good for that. That's there's a scene in there. I remember I was sitting at the keyboard and I'm just literally sobbing and I'm like, Oh no, the, tears are going to get on my keyboard and my keyboard's going to short out and <laughs> but um I still go back and reread that scene because I just it just works and sometimes I read the happy scenes um or I'll even read the short stories that I write for my newsletter um just you know because yeah like I wrote it because it's something I wanted to see and yeah. so I enjoy going back you're, you're, if you're writing your own catnip, 
and it works on you, then by all means, like, exactly. why not? Exactly. Exactly. You know, when I was a kid, um, this was pre-internet, so, and <sighs> I didn't know about, <laughs> I didn't know about fan fiction or anything. I used to make up, in my head, I would make up the ends, like epilogues for books that I really loved. I would just keep going with Oh my the God, characters. me too. Yeah. So like writing my own mental fan fiction. So now I just write fan fiction for my own books. So it's great. <laughs> okay. I love that. You're creating fan fiction for your own book in your own world. <laughs> just having a good old time. That's right. It's fun. That's it's sweet. fun. <laughs> So you've created a world that is so entertaining and so enjoyable and so filled with all of your different strains of catnip that you basically never need to leave. Yeah. I can't imagine not writing in this world. Uh, But, you know, I I joke about that. But I think at some point, if I feel like these characters in this world is exactly where they need to be, then I think I would make myself stop. Because I think it would be worse to keep going with a watered down version, if you know what I mean. I would. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't see that coming anytime soon. There is so much in this world to explore. There's so many stories and so many uh, pathways to go down to see what lies at the end. But if I did ever get to that point, no, I, I hope I would have the strength to, to let go, you know, yeah. <laughs> I have attachment issues, but, <laughs> but yeah, yeah, I think I, I do always keep that in the back of my mind. Is it, are we reaching that point? And we haven't yet, so I am free to go forth. Yeah, I, I don't, I don't, I don't think you've reached that point, not <laughs> until you're at least 195. Oh, well, but, there you go. I write it. Yeah, yeah. right. It, But also, you've created a world in which there are so many incredibly powerful entities trying to achieve some kind of coexistence and balance, and then equally powerful entities trying to not have harmony and balance, that there's a lot of ways to explore all of the the ways that shit can go terribly wrong. This is true. This is true, as we find out in Alpha Night. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Like, oh, shit goes sideways in a hurry, especially when you can kill somebody with your brain. That's true. Yeah, it's um. Yeah, I mean, you've put it perfectly. Basically, there's there's so many powers <laughs> pushing at this world. It's like, how can you find equilibrium when there is no one power that is, you know, supreme? And in a way, that is the strength of the world. That oh, there absolutely. are, but at the same time, how can they coexist? Which is the question of the series? Yeah. yeah. Especially because half of the people, or not half, but a portion of the people who exist in the world, who achieve so much power, are doing so um, initially based on the idea that they shouldn't have any emotions. Yes, so exactly. Part of the power balance is not having feelings, which is not a mm. thing that you can really do. Well, they thought they could, and now the right. you know the chickens are coming home to roost, and, and it didn't we're work finding out. So good. That, yeah, yeah. So I'm just I I truly am. As fascinated by this world as I was at the start when I started writing Slave to Sensation. Now, I this is a bit unfair because I didn't send you this in advance, but has your understanding of psychology and emotions changed and evolved as you've been writing this world? Um, yeah, I think so. I think um, I have learned, I always did research, you know, from the start, I've done constant research and I'm constantly learning. So, yes. Um, I think my understanding has gained more depth. I don't mm-hmm. think what I understood then and what I understand now, there's not been like a significant shift, but it's more a case of depth and sub- subtlety mm-hmm. and having more knowledge and having spoken to more people who are experts. And yeah, yeah, for sure. It, as a writer, I'm, I'm a big believer in growth, and part of growth is taking the time to become educated um, in various aspects of research that relate to the books I'm writing. So I am constantly, you know, reading. I read, I read a lot of nonfiction as well, and just constantly absorbing 
information about humanity and our psyches and the way our brains work. Um, so, yeah, for sure. Aria, who is a rather, rather large fan of yours, which is a significant understatement. Um, I asked her if she had anything that she wanted me to ask you about for this interview. And she wanted to know about the very deliberate, explicit consent in Alpha Night. And no spoilers, obviously. Because mm-hmm. there's she's, she pointed out there's always been consent in your books previously. It's not as if you're like, oh, consent. That's a good idea. It's always been there. But this scene was written with very specific consensual detail. What was your thought process while while writing the consent in this book? Does it relate to the to the idea of the knight to her queen? Exactly. Yeah. You. Um. It came from the character. So, without spoiling it, the book for anyone who hasn't read it, Ethan's history makes him a very sort of unique kind of character in some ways, and his belief that he is the knight to her queen. There's a kind of there's a kind of almost obsessive devotion about mm-hmm. it. And as I'm writing that scene, you know, I was, I'm in his head and, and I'm in her head, you know, at the same time, no matter which point of view I write in, in the book, I'm always in both characters' heads. And as I'm writing, I came to a sudden halt because I thought, hold on, the way he thinks, the way he acts, would he understand consent in this kind of situation would his brain function that way to say that actually I can stop this no matter what she wants even though she is my queen like in that Mm -hmm. thinking process if he was in Mm -hmm. and so I did have to consciously think about that and at the same time you know I'm in Selenka's head and she's also thinking the same thing she's having that sort of hitch that moment saying hold on hold on are we both on the same page here because she's starting to understand how Ethan sees the world and how he sees their relationship so it really really came from the characters particularly the character of Ethan and and that's why it's so explicit in this book because for Ethan he needs it to be that explicit yes Yes, it's it's part of his growth and under. I'm trying to say this non spoilery. Um, it's part it's part of his understanding of 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 growth and connection. Yes, it's like there's there's been certain massive gaps in Ethan's life. Um, even more uh, so. A in, few. Oh. Yeah, <laughs> even more so than the other arrows. I mean, the arrows are not the most had not the most stable sort of childhoods, but Ethan no. was even worse. You know. Yeah, and, and arrows just, are not the most emotionally fluent creatures. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> and Ethan is just like, like at one end of that. And he he has had, you know, there are just certain things he just will not understand unless you just have to be really, really open with him. And this was one of those situations where it was, they both had to be absolutely on the same page. And because of who Selenka is as well, if they weren't on the same page, that would do so much damage to them both. And so it was really important to have that conversation on the page. Because how else is he going to understand it? Mm, Exactly. So Arya also noticed that the definition and the, the limitations and boundaries of skin privileges has changed and evolved. Like you said, you learn nuance and depth of, of emotional connection. And it also seems to apply to, to the skin privileges, especially as connected to consent. Has that been like a, a, a conscious or deliberate adjustment in your world building? Is that something that you've consciously done or is that something that's grown with your understanding of physical and emotional connection? I think it's a case of a, uh, subconscious growth mostly of you know slave to sensation i wrote in 2005 it's published in 2006 so that's you know 15 years and who i was 15 years ago is not the same person i am now i think that would hold for anyone and the world is not the same world it was 15 years ago and so no yeah, I think I've changed and hopefully become better as a human being over the years. And I've 
learned more and I've understood more. And I think it's inevitable that that shows up in the writing. And we've gone through um, all these things in the world, you know, with the Me Too movement and not just that, but all the conversations we've been having over all those years, you know, big and small. And it's had an effect, you know, on the way I write. And it's not conscious for the most part. Like I said, with Ethan, it was very conscious because of his characterization. But in general, I am a very instinctive writer. I tend to just fall into the story um, and fall into the emotions of the story and go with it. But I think all these things that have happened in the world, all the years I've lived in the world, the changes are going to happen. It's uh, I think it happens with every writer. And in my case, it's probably a little bit more trackable because I'm writing, I'm writing this big series that's gone on for so long. I think my voice has stayed the same um, throughout my writing career, but probably my understanding of the world has deepened. And again, yeah, like we talked about the depth and the subtlety um, of understanding of how people relate to each other and yeah you're not going to stay in the same place especially if you're exploring a world that big exactly I think it's um it would be very unusual to to be exactly the same writer you know 15 books long or it's more than that now I'm losing track um but uh, (laughs) (laughs) but unless you were writing those books in very close proximity and and I haven't you know I've been over a decade, a decade and a half, these books have been written. So hopefully I've matured in terms mm-hmm. of um, my just my understanding of people and of emotions and, and all of those things, and they all feed into the work. Um, I'm not like I'm not an autobiographical writer in any sense. I don't sort of take real world events or real world things that have happened to me and put them in books. But I think all the things that happen to me, all the journeys I take in life, they'll show up in the books in terms of how I relate to the characters and how they relate to each other. So mm-hmm. mm, so that the the change is in the background. Um, you know, that subconscious and but that's where the stories come from. So it's gonna show up. Of course. Yeah. I noticed that uh, in in your next release this year, and in I right now it's scheduled for November. I don't know if if it'll move or if it has moved, but I know that Archangel Sun mm-hmm. is uh, is next on your release target, and you're um, you're writing about the Archangel of of, uh, of death and the uh, Archangel of disease. <laughs> You need yeah. to chill. You're telling me, oh no, I don't. I don't write autobiographically. No, not at oh. all. Okay, uh, I, I I beg to differ. <laughs> it's like that book was written. Like you know, like everything was planned. I I wrote the book, and <laughs> all the stuff happened. And I was like, nobody's going to want to read this book now. But <laughs> no, I don't think that's true. <laughs> but um, I have to tell you, it's it's actually. It's the aftermath of Archangel's War, uh, where right. this book is set. So, and it's it's a surprisingly I I want to use the word fun book, despite of all the the dark things that are happening. Because you know Titus, the Archangel of Africa, he is the best. I love him so much. <laughs> and he is just, he just lights up the page. He takes over the page when he's on it. And, but then we've got the hummingbird who is, she is also the best. These two are just, you just put them together and things go boom. And it's, I just, I just was like sitting there going, <laughs> and writing their interactions. And, um, my my editor basically just sent me like a whole row of exclamation marks after she Aww. she read them. So it's I just I really hope readers you know love the book because I just absolutely adore it. I think these two are just amazing together, and um, yeah. So despite all the the darkness that's going on in in the Guild Hunter world, there's these their characters just you know 
come off the page and I just, their interactions, I don't even know what to call it. It's some kind of chemistry, you know, but you'll have to read to find out. Ah, fine. <laughs> fine. Okay, sure. <laughs> so what are, aside from book release and, you know, talking with me, what are you working on right now? I'm currently working on uh, my next New Zealand set thriller. So, Ooh. Yeah. so it's going to be a little bit different again. And um, so these thrillers are all standalones. And it's interesting. It's from a writing perspective, it's a completely different structure uh, in terms of the book. So with the first book, I had to be more conscious about it and just make sure I wasn't slipping into making it a romance. Um, but this one, it feels more natural to just, you know, to stay in that thriller sort of mindset. And, yeah, it's fun. You know, it's um, – <laughs> I just I, – I look up all kinds of things and I'm, like, wondering if anyone's, you know, following my internet search history, they're going to think I'm a – serial killer or something but I'm not <laughs> and um but yeah it's been fascinating because it's set in New Zealand I know the areas really well and um I live in a beautiful country but there's so much you know there's so much danger there if you look at it from that perspective and mm -hmm. so yeah it's it's really fun so I've got my head down doing that at the moment I'm um doing the first draft so, which is basically just telling myself the story. No one else ever reads my first draft, so I would not give it to anyone. And, but it's critical for me. Um, I call it like the skeleton. You know, this is the skeleton of the story. And I always, I'm not one of those people who can write like a few chapters and make them perfect and then write the next chapters. I just blurt out the whole thing doesn't matter if it's messy, if there's typos, or if there's gaps. The point is to get from the beginning to the end somehow, mm -hmm. um, not necessarily sequentially. And, um, yeah, so that's where I'm – it's quite fun. You know, I'm, I'm at the end of the first draft now, so I'm sort of writing obsessively because I need to get to the big climax and how to make that happen. Yeah. And you know what happens in your books when you sit down to write them. You know sort of the major points. Am I remembering correctly? Yeah, I usually know the major points. I'm not a big plotter or anything. I don't sort of write stuff down. That's a little bit different for the mysteries. With the mysteries, I do sit down and have a more of a sort of structured think about it. But still, it's more about characters usually. And the one thing I do know with the thrillers always is, um, you know, who did it basically what what the answer is because that helps me put all the little threads in place at the start and that's yeah that sort of is that's true for my um you know my paranormal romances as well because there's always an overarching storyline and so I always know that um, and that holds everything together and then I just go in this thriller um it, I take it that the the fact that if you're stupid the land will kill you is a element to the story a little bit not as much in this this one as in the last one but the landscape will always be a part of these books for me I think because it is such an integral part of life <laughs> here you know I live in a city but I get in my car in half an hour I'm I'm on a black sand beach with these massive waves and hardly any people <laughs> because they're just the beaches are endless, you know. So it's just the awareness mm -hmm. of nature is just part of existence. So that comes through in the books as well, I think. And it's also just such a part of Kiwi culture. It definitely Generally. is. Absolutely. <laughs> so one of the hardest things in quarantine, I think, for everyone has been um, we were allowed to go for walks, which was great. Um, but not being able to go out into the bush or go fishing or go climbing or, you know, jump off bridges, oh, yeah. if that's your thing. Um, <laughs> so, what's it called? Is it tr tramping? Tramping, yeah. Yeah, tramping yeah. is, um, I think you guys, you would say hiking. But yeah. it's not really, it's rougher than hiking, I guess, because there, there's just so much bush in New Zealand that um, 
it's not there's no paths you kind of have to make your own path and I read a, a really good book recently called Bewildered by Laura Winters I want to say and it's the journey she, it's a like non-fiction and it's about her journey from along the Te Araroa Trail um, from the tip of the North Island to the tip of the South Island and that's a walk Whoa. it's massive it's like months and months but when we say trail <laughs> not necessarily like like you know she's literally swimming across rivers and you kind of have to find your own way through the mountains and you know <laughs> it's 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 a really good book but it kind of shows you the amount of wilderness that is still present here and um what it takes to sort of go into it yeah and it's and it's staggeringly beautiful it is. It's so beautiful. I've, you know, I've, I do a lot of traveling, but I keep coming back to here and thinking it is really one of the most beautiful places I've ever seen and, in the world. Yeah. And and that's high praise because you were born in Fiji, which is not ugly. No, I mean, Fiji is a different <laughs> kind of beauty altogether. You know, it's, it's one of these things where you can't really compare because New Zealand has, um, has the Southern Alps, you know, it's got the snow, it's got the mountains and rivers and forests, whereas Fiji has got the tropical beaches, you know, the tropical yep. ocean where the, where the water color is, it's so clear that you can see mm-hmm. like little colorful tropical fish. You can just stand on the beach and the tropical fish will swim around your feet. You know, so it, it, it really is like a brochure. <laughs> um, <laughs> sometimes, you know, you see these travel brochures and then you turn up and it's, it's like disappointing. Yeah, no. Go to one no. of the Fijian beaches and you'd be like, wow, what am I even doing here? It's, it's not even real. Um, but yeah, it's just uh, different kinds of beauty. I think New Zealand has more of that raw, sort of untamed, really um, almost harsh beauty. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I had to do a layover in Fiji. Um, just in the airport. And I remember watching the sun come up at the airport and I was like, oh my gosh, even the view from the airport is pretty. What <laughs> is this country? What is this crap? <laughs> yeah. With, with the palm trees and, um, yeah. yeah. The one thing I always remember when I go to Fiji is, um, when you walk off the, um, the airplane bridge and the wave of heat that just hits you <laughs> as soon as you get off the plane, it's like a wall. <laughs> it is. It's like a wall. You walk into this heat, and it's this humid heat. I mean, you, after a while, you get uh, you know acclimatized to it. But I just—that's mm-hmm. one of my okay. I'm, and because I grew up there, I have the same feeling when I go there and when I come back to New Zealand, which is that oh, I'm home. You know, feels like home, and it's Aww. two completely different countries, and um. Yet the feeling is so familiar in both places. Yeah. yeah. Do you feel the same way when you go back to Japan? I know you lived there for a while. Yeah, it's funny. I haven't been back uh, since I returned um, home to New Zealand. But when I used to travel, um, like when I was living in Japan and I'd come to New Zealand and then go back, I would have that same feeling as well, that famili- feeling of familiarity and being home and just normal everything yeah. normal. I don't know if it would still happen because it's been so long since I've been back. Mm-hmm. But I do know that I have these moments where something will happen that will remind me of Japan. And I do have those very sort of um, nostalgic and warm feelings about it. So yeah. it might, you know, I might step off a plane and be like, wow, this just feels so right. Yeah. Yeah. So I always ask this, what are you reading that you want to tell people about? Okay, so like I made a list because I knew we would talk this about this. This is why I like you. <laughs> so recently, I've been really into um, like the British police procedurals. Ooh, where it's I don't know. Do you guys get like uh, Vera and um, Shetland? Those kind of shows in the US. We can get them through different streaming services. Definitely Shetland. Yes. Yeah. So it's you know I like that kind of. Um, I don't want to say it's almost a, the pace is different in the British mm-hmm. police produce rules. It's a very sort of a solving the mystery and, the, you know, all the characters and um, yes. it's They're just almost cozy, but not quite. Not quite. 
yeah and there's no sort of um they're not gory you know they're no. they're more it's about the solving of the mystery but one author i recently found is um paul gitcham and he writes the dci warren jones series and i've just glommed them like i just like he has you know there's the detective and then he's got his his cast of um like his sergeant and the other inspectors around him and and it's I'm just loving the series. So I've just been going nom, nom, nom and working my way through them. The other one I read recently is Anne Cleves, um, The Long Call. And Anne Cleves is the writer behind Shetland. So they're based off her books. Um, and the books are fantastic as well. I love her as a writer. So those are my two British ones. Um, um, and currently I'm listening to the audiobook of... Mia Sosa's The Worst Best Man and I just started that yesterday and I am already I am already fully on the side of the heroine Lena you know? <laughs> I'm like yeah so that's all I'll say for the moment but yeah it's, I'm having fun <laughs> with that one and um I, up up next should I tell you about my TBR oh please do Okay, so I'm I've got Martha Wells Network Effect. Um Ooh. and that's part of the Murderbot Diaries. I I'm reading that next. I'm so excited. <laughs> I am so that is such a good series, right? <laughs> it's so good. I was thinking of it when you were talking about rereading. Like I just went through the first four Murderbot novellas. Because once you've won read one, you kind of get it. Yeah, and it's such a deep point of view, but I'm like so excited about the book. Oh my god, I can't wait. I've been I so for some reason I read the first novella like an audiobook, and I just really love the narrator. So I've got the audio. I've ended up reading most of you know the previous novellas in audio, and um, oh. so I've got network effect in audio as well because I just. I think the narrator is just brilliant. And, um, yeah, so I can't wait to have Murderbot's voice in my head again. Oh, <laughs> I'm going to have to try the audio. That sounds really good. Yeah, you should try it. He does a, such a good job, you know, because the character has this sort of, you know, he has that sarcastic sort of dry, I don't know, that yes. voice. And it just comes through in the audio and it's, yeah, so good. Um, and then on my TBI, I've also got Lucy Parker's Headliners. Um, and Sonali Dev's Recipe for Persuasion. And I just had an anthology pop into my um, Kindle, and I hadn't, re I, if I forgot, I ordered it. Um, so this is great. <laughs> this is like a great surprise. I think I saw like a promo on Twitter, and I just thought that sounds like my kind of thing. And it's um, He's Come Undone by Emma Berry, Olivia Dade, Kat Sebastian, Adriana Herrera, and Ruby Lang. And, um, yeah, it just looks really fun. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, I've also got a couple of um, things that I've said I'd read f to see if I would, um, you know, blurb them, like give an earth a blurb. And that's always fun, especially when it's debuts, because I go in with no preconceptions. and. You know, and I always hope that I will love it because it's really nice to be able to to do something for a debut author. Oh, and I have two more that I want to mention, and these Please I read do. previously, but I, they're coming out soonish. I think one's in May and one's in June, so keep an eye out for them. The first is Farah Roshan's The Boyfriend Project, um, and where these three women they find out that this one guy is like three timing them. And they end up, gang, you know, ganging up on him in a restaurant and it goes viral. Like someone tweets mm -hmm. it and it goes viral. It's good fun. And then Quana Jackson's Real Men Knit, which is about a group of men who um, inherit um, the knitting store that their mother ran and loved. And, you know, it's in trouble and they have to save it. And it's just just got such a beautiful heart, that book. And it's fun. I mean, it's really romantic and it's fun as well. And I was just really into it, and I want to know about the other characters, especially there's this one character, this one brother, who is so worried about his sheets, his <laughs> high thread count sheets that they dared to sleep on, and he's just fabulous. He is just 
totally stiff and <laughs> you know just you just want to see him unravel so um yeah so and I've got so many more like I've got Rebecca Witherspoon I love to Rafe I read it last year I think and I've got a bunch of her books um sort of lined up that I want to dive into as well and I could just keep going because the TBR is endless yeah it's the nice thing with digital books though they don't take up much space yeah, I have to say though, I just did, <laughs> I just did a massive order with my local indie, um, just chapters. I'm really lucky. Um, chapters in Auckland is like a romance, um, specific bookstore. Ooh. And, and um, yeah, so <laughs> and I really, really like print as well. So I've just done a big order of um, books with chapter, and um, yeah, I can't wait to get them. <laughs> even though I have no room on my bookshelves I'll find space somewhere yeah, yeah you'll find it <laughs> and that brings us to the end of this week's episode thank you again for hanging out with me thank you to Nalini for hanging out with me as well and thank you to our Patreon community for making the show possible and making sure that every episode has a transcript the Patreon community is truly a excellent group of human beings and if you'd like to join them have a look at patreon.com slash smart bitches i will have links to every book that was mentioned do not worry and i will have links to some of the recipes too including that recipe for the chocolate pitch cupcakes with the peanut butter yeah i'm gonna make those very soon very very soon i have a joke i always have a joke this one's really bad because here in my world it is the last week of online schooling uh so my children are very excited. I figured a math joke would be a good idea because a bad joke is great, but a bad math joke is exquisite. So are you ready? Here we go. If puns make you numb, what do math puns make you? They make you number. <laughs> it's so dumb. I love it so much. Ah, oh, Thank you to Ikenna Z on Reddit for that one. That made me snort laugh. On behalf of everyone here, I wish you the very best of reading. I hope that you and yours are safe and sound. And I will see you back here next week for more podcasts and more really bad jokes. Thank you again for joining me. It's an honor to be in your eardrums. Smart Podcast Trashy Books is part of the Frolic Podcast Network. You can find more outstanding podcasts to listen to at frolic.media slash podcasts.